Okay. Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And <clears throat> excuse me, this morning we are going to be looking at H133, uh, which is a bill, um, emergency relief from abuse orders and relinquishment of firearms. And we are going to start with attorney Eric Fitzpatrick to do a walkthrough. Welcome, Eric. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel <clears throat> here to, <clears throat> excuse me, give a walkthrough and talk a little bit about uh, H-133, which, uh, as the chair just mentioned, is an act relating to emergency relief from abuse orders and relinquishment of firearms. The topic of relief from abuse orders, I know, is something that the committee has spent quite a bit of time talking about uh, over the last couple of years, uh, but it's been a while since we talked about it and there are some new members on the committee as well. So I thought it would be helpful given that for me to spend a couple of minutes at first sort of giving the lay of the land and let folks know what the, what the current state of the law is. So that in, the, in this case in particular, it's very helpful and really necessary to know what that current state of the law is in order to get a good grasp on what the bill is proposing to do. So I'll do that first. And actually, even before I do that, as I mentioned to you before, when I do a walkthrough, I like to take just a minute <clears throat> before we even look at any language and just explain in general terms what the bill is doing. That kind of gives everybody a big picture, 50,000 feet view of, well, what's the proposal being made in the bill, in this case, H-133. So as I mentioned, it's uh, ad addressing the topic of relief from abuse orders and a relief from abuse order uh, known as an RFA is the acronym. It's when a, a plaintiff, and that's a person who brings a court action. Remember, we have a plaintiff brings a court action, and a defendant is a person against whom the action is brought, who defends against the action. A plaintiff uh, can be a family or household member, can go into the court and get an order, known as this RFA, Relief from Abuse Order, issued against the defendant uh, in order to protect the uh, plaintiff the family or household member from future harm. So if the plaintiff can show that there's a date that they've been abused and that there is a danger of future abuse, then uh, the court can issue a, this order, an RFA that will direct certain things. There's a long list of things. Um, and in fact, a very broad list of, of uh, components that can be in the court's order that would essentially be saying uh, to the defendant, for just to give you a few examples, that could be a no contact order. In other words, you can't contact the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children. You can't, could be an order to vacate. You must leave the plaintiff's house. Uh, you have to stay a certain distance away from the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children. You know, you have to provide child support. There's, there's a long list and, and not an exclusive list, I might add, uh, of what could be in this order. And the court would issue that order against the defendant. Um, and that would limit the sort of conduct that the defendant can have with respect to the plaintiff and the plaintiff's children. So that's how the RFA would work. Typically speaking, um, the and this sort of brings up an important point for purposes of the bill too, there's two types of these RFAs, two types of relief from abuse orders. There's a final order, and there's also an emergency or temporary order. So the, the emergency and temporary terms are sometimes used interchangeably, but they refer to the same thing, the temporary or emergency order, and you also have the final order. What's the, dif the difference, the two main differences between the two things? Uh, the final order generally requires that there be notice provided to the defendant and an opportunity for the defendant to come to the hearing and argue against why the order shouldn't be issued. On the other hand, the emergency order, the temporary order, can be issued ex parte. I don't know if that's a phrase everybody remembers, but it means from one side or by one party only. That means that an emergency order, a temporary order, can be issued even though the defendant is not there at the hearing. The plaintiff can go, go in uh, individually by themselves and uh, show that an immediate, you know, so you'll see that's a, a, a word that's used in the emergency order statute, but not in the final order statute. If they can show there's an immediate danger of further abuse, you can get this emergency order, this temporary order issued without the defendant being present. So because that's done without uh, notice or the defendant being present, you will remember that this implicates due process concerns because it's important you know, for people in order to have their rights affected, they have an opportunity under the due process clause of, of both the US and uh, Vermont constitutions 
to have notice and an opportunity to be heard. There are limited situations in which uh, proceedings can go forward without that kind of notice and an opportunity to be heard, but there always has to be uh, a, a quick opportunity for the person to come into court afterward. So you have to be able to get into court uh, reasonably quickly afterward, uh, even though there's been an emergency situation to start with, uh, and then argue uh, you know, why it is you don't think the order should issue. So in this case, in the emergency temporary uh, RFA situation, it only lasts for 14 days. That emergency temporary order only lasts for 14 days. And within that 14 day period, it has to schedule a hearing so that the defendant com can come in and have notice and argue you know, why it is they may think that the, the uh, emergency or final order shouldn't issue. So that satisfies the due process requirement. So uh, they quickly get an opportunity to come in and make that argument. So uh, those are the, the crucial distinctions between this emergency order and the final order. Uh, the emergency order can be done ex parte with only the plaintiff present, and it only lasts for 14 days. Whereas the final order, the defendant has to be present. There has to be a hearing with the defendant there, and it can last for uh, whatever period that the court has to set the period in the order, uh, the length of time, uh, but can be as much as a year, uh, but uh, um, obviously much longer than the 14 day limit that's on the emergency order. So what, with that bit of big picture background, uh, as I mentioned in statute, there are lists of different components and elements that can be part of this order. You know, what can the, can the order contain? Uh, what limitations on the defendant's ability to do? You know, as I mentioned, don't contact the plaintiff, move out of the plaintiff's house, et cetera, et cetera. What H-133 does is it adds one piece to that list. It adds uh, a, an additional component that the court can include in this emergency order. And this only applies to the emergency order, the temporary one that's in effect for 14 days. And what it adds to that is basically a provision that says um, the court may order, if there's evidence that uh, uh, certain particular evidence you'll see in the language when we look at it about the defendant having firearms or um, in that case, then the court can order that the defendant relinquish their firearms. So again, it's not a requirement, but it's a permissive piece of the order uh, that can be included. And the, what H33 proposes to do is to add that ability of the court uh, to the list of um, uh, elements that the court can include in this emergency relief from abuse order. I should mention that that in, in many ways that's a clarification of existing law uh, because some courts view, uh, some judges I should say, and I think Judge Gerson will talk about this in more detail, but some judges view that the court sort of inherent power to address emergencies and the court does have that authority, you know, for where to issue uh, temporary restraining orders, injunctions, that sort of thing to address emergency situations that the court already has some uh, authority to issue. For example, if there were a dangerous situation, a requirement that the defendant relinquish firearms. But I think other judges uh, may not view it that, that way. And that there's also at the very least uh, a lack of clarity in the statute about whether or not that authority exists. So the proposal here is to resolve any ambiguity that there may be out there and just make it clear that the, the court does have um, the authority to include firearms relinquishment as part of the emergency relief from abuse order. So that is the big picture of what's going on without having looked at any language yet. Um, but uh, my thought was now to take a moment to look at the existing statute, and then that'll segue us right into uh, the proposal being made in the bill. But I can also pause here if there's there any initial questions, if anybody wants me to slow down or um, address anything that might be on anybody's mind. Eric, when you do the walkthrough, will you have, um, will you be able to show us existing law? So, um, 1104A one through three, or or um, if not, if you could post um, current law, I think that would be helpful. The current law is posted. Yep, uh, I sent that to Mike, and I, that's what I'm gonna I'm going to when I share my screen in a moment. I'm just gonna go over to uh, to that. So you should on on the documents under my name for today's uh, testimony, the current chapter on relief from abuse orders, which includes all that language, is, is posted. Great. And Eric, we're in Title 15. If you could just remind us what 
because sometimes this committee is in Title 15, we're often in Title 13. That's right. Title 15 uh, refers to family proceedings in the family division, family proceedings. And we're not in, uh, we're not in Title 13, which is the criminal code. So these are not cr criminal proceedings. These are civil proceedings in the family division. Great, thank you. Uh, sure. Kate, I see Kate's hand up. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to clarify what you were just referring to in terms of how things are currently operating within the court. Were you saying that currently judges are in some instances already requiring firearms be removed from homes during this temporary order or am I, did I misunderstand that? No, that uh, I think Judge Grierson will testify about that in more detail, but yes, that is my understanding that in some instances, some judges view that as within their authority, but others uh, think the, the law on that is not so clear. Thanks. So I'm not seeing any further hands. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll start sharing my screen and look at the current statute now. Uh, also, I should mention that you probably already know this, but when I'm sharing my screen, I can't see everybody. So if somebody has a question, feel free to just interrupt me. I, I'll, I'll be happy to be interrupted if uh, um, uh, you've got something you want me to you know, take a pause on or answer a question. So please feel free to do that. All right. Now is everybody is everybody seeing my screen? Yes. Good. Yep. Thank you. So I'm now looking at what you now see in front of you then is in as uh, the chair mentioned in Title 15, the Domestic Relations Family Proceedings chap title of uh, the Vermont statutes, we're looking at the abuse prevention chapter and this is the lengthy detailed series of statutes that you have addressing relief from abuse orders. These are this is, uh, not a, you know, a short statute that addresses these types of proceedings at all. They're lengthy, quite lengthy, and uh, are there with a lot of detail. So the first thing I'm gonna look at is section, uh, you'll see 1103, and this is the final uh, relief from abuse order statute. Now, for some reason, I've never quite understood, uh, even though chronologically the emergency or temporary order would come first, the final order is first in the statute, but uh, uh, it's been on the book since 1979. So uh, I guess it's sort of ingrained as to that's how it is, but I've always thought that was, you know, in terms of chronology, it should be reversed. So uh, in terms of the final order though, it is helpful to look at it, this one first, uh, because actually the terminology that's used uh, flows through both, uh, both the final order provision and the temporary provision and in some sense, it seems like the temporary order can be viewed as sort of part of this entire uh, uh, proceeding that they're, you know, the same language applies to both. They're all sort of part and parcel of the same action in many cases. So this is the language regarding the emergent, uh, sorry, the final relief from abuse order proceeding. And you'll see it starts right off uh, with what I was mentioning earlier. Any family or household member may seek re relief from abuse by another family or household member uh, on behalf of himself or herself or his or her children by filing a complaint under this chapter. Now that's the, the main crux of what's going on in all these proceedings. It's so that you're, you see, first of all, that it's not just anybody who can bring an RFA petition or file a complaint for relief from abuse. It has to be a family or household member. They're the person who can seek relief from abuse. And that um, is a defined term. So I'm gonna go right back up to the definition section and you'll see family member is not defined because that's obviously uh, whether or not someone uh, is related in the same family, but household member is defined. And you see that means people who for any period of time have living, are living or have lived together, <clears throat> sharing or have shared occupant, occupancy of a dwelling or have engaged in a sexual or dating relationship. And dating relationship is then defined as well. So uh, you have to fit under that definition of a household member or be a family member to even file uh, a request for relief from abuse. But assuming you, you do, if you fit uh, into one of those two categories, then you can ask the court for an RFA to uh, direct the defendant to uh, 
not engage in any further harmful behavior. And I have to say the last sentence, there's, a, there's some particular provisions about um, uh, how minors may file the petition. I'm gonna pass over, that's not really relevant to what we're talking about here. You see the last sentence though does talk about that the plaintiff has to submit an affidavit in support of uh, their request. So they have to uh, you know, swear under penalties of perjury that uh, the facts they're asserting are true. So there has to be this affidavit. Um, again, moving on to subsection B, you'll see that- uh, Eric, before you, before you jump to uh, B. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, um, this, is, this is Tom, if you don't see me or recognize my voice. I know. <laughs> I recognize <laughs> I, Well, I figured. And uh, uh, re, at the, right at the top of request for relief, uh, we probably discussed it in the past, but why is that so narrow? Because with this language, I can't get a uh, RFA say on you. Um, I think the, the idea is uh, that it's meant to address this sort of evidence that uh, of abuse between family members that has happened over time. And that, and that because of that evidence that's out there, that's why it's targeted at that uh, particular, um, particular instances where that occurs. And now that's not to say that, that not under this chapter, but that uh, you might be able to get an order against stalking, for example, if, against uh, someone who may fall outside of that category. Or no. even just what I was referring to in the very beginning to the court's inherent authority to address an emergency. You may, uh, you may be able to get the court to issue sort of a general temporary restraining order when there's a threat of violence by someone who doesn't fit one of these categories. But I think this chapter in particular, is, as the chair was mentioning, being located in the family proceedings chapter is really meant to address these situations between family and household members. Sure, I, I, I mean, I, not dealing with it all the time. I, I just couldn't remember any other avenues for people, but um, but thank you for your explanation because it does show that there is other other ways people can um, get, if not an RFA, something very similar. Right, that's right. Um, so yeah, as, as I mentioned earlier, you'll see in the first sentence of subsection B says court generally has to, can only give one of, provide one of these final orders after notice to the defendant and a hearing. Everybody see that in that first sentence. You see there's the first clause, except as provided in section 1104. That's because 1104 is the emergency temporary statute. Remember that's the one uh, that I mentioned can be issued uh, on an emergency basis ex parte without the defendant there so that there isn't notice to the defendant and a hearing. So in that particular circumstance that is exempted, uh, there can be an order issued uh, without providing notice and a hearing. But remember, it only lasts for 14 days. Within that 14 day period, there has to be hearing, a hearing and notice to the defendant. Um, second sentence refers to the burden of proof, which I'm gonna come back to in just a moment. Before I get to that, I want to look at sub subsection C here. So, all right, so now we know that the, the plaintiff who has to be a family or household member can come into court, seek this relief from abuse order, uh, and there has to be hearing and uh, notice to the defendant, there has to be an affidavit. Now the court can make, so you look at subsection C, the court can make, shall make such orders as it deems necessary to protect the plaintiff or the children or both. Remember, that's, that's a very broad statement right there too. Such orders as it deems necessary to protect the plaintiff or the children. So that's broad authority, any order that, that's necessary to protect them. Um, if the court finds, and this is the crucial point, there's two things that the court has to find in order to issue this order. First, that the defendant has abused the plaintiff, that's number one, and number two, one of two things. Either there's a danger of further abuse or the defendant is currently incarcerated and has been convicted of one of the following, and then there's a list of offenses there. So that one obviously is pretty easy to uh, unpack. It's either, you know, if they're currently incarcerated and has, and has been convicted of one of those offenses, uh, pretty cut and dry whether a person uh, would be subject to an RFA under that provision. Uh, the prior one, though, is depends on the nature of the term abuse, right? Because the court has to make this finding that, number one, defendant has abused the plaintiff in the past, and two, there's a danger of further abuse. So that begs the question, which is also defined in statute, what does abuse mean? I'm paging back up to the definition section again. You'll see 
Abuse means the occurrence of one or more of the following acts between family or household members. Crucial again, only that group of people. And it can be one of those five things, attempting to cause or causing physical harm, placing another in fear of imminent serious physical harm, abuse to children, stalking, sexual assault. So any one of those five things counts as abuse. And if that has occurred in the past, let's go back to what the court has to find again. Uh, the court finds the defendant has abused the plaintiff. In other words, it's occurred before and there's a danger of further abuse, it might occur again. Uh, then it can issue this order um, that may include the following. See that subdivision two there? This is what I mentioned earlier, that this, there's a lengthy list. This is in the final order, a lengthy list of what could be in the order. And I should also point out in subdivision two, the order may include the following. This is not an exclusive list, because remember, we also saw language before earlier, right uh, in sub C there, shall the court shall make such orders as it deems necessary to protect the plaintiff or children or both. So that's very broad. Court, whatever is necessary for protection, but the order may include, there's a non-exclusive list of what might be in the order. And this is, you know, reiterates some of what I mentioned when I did the big picture overview at the beginning. Uh, subdivision A there, the defendant refrained from abusing the plaintiff or the children or both in the future, interfering with the, the plaintiff's personal liberty, including restrictions on the defendant's ability to contact the plaintiff. So that's what I mentioned, the no contact order is frequently a part of these RFAs. The defendant is ordered not to contact the plaintiff uh, as long as this order is in effect. Uh, so um, that's so sort of- some... Eric, I'm sorry, um, I see coach's hand is up. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eric, um, uh, just for uh, clarification, um, mandated reporters, uh, how do they fit into uh, that group of, uh, or do they fit in directly or, or indirectly into uh, that group uh, at the beginning? Uh, yeah, I think that's a separate, a separate issue, Coach. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, they could be fit into it in the sense that if, if someone was a family or household member uh, of the defendant, the person who was alleging abuse, and they were a mandated reporter, then they could do, they would have, if they were a mandated, report, mandated reporter, they would have to make the report, obviously. Uh, and if they also happen to be a family or household member of the person who was allegedly committing the abuse, then they could file um, for an RFA. So it, they could be the, uh, have the ability to sort of invoke both proceedings, but they might not either, depending on who the person is. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Um, so the, uh, yeah, so this is the list of what could, potential things that could be in the order. Just mentioned the, the no contact piece of it. Uh, an order to vacate, you see in subdivision B, that's what I mentioned earlier, it could be an order to vacate the household, subdivision C, temporary award of parental rights and responsibilities, D, orders about parent-child contact, um, child support is in E. Uh, so there's a lengthy list here. We don't need to go through each, each component, but there's a, a lot of things that may be included in this order. So that brings us back to uh, subdivision B for a moment, because now we've seen, okay, uh, the plaintiff has to come in, has to be a family or household member. Uh, the court has to find that, it has to be an affidavit, the court has to find that the defendant has abused the plaintiff and there's a danger of further abuse uh, in order for this order to be issued. So, uh, you know, to what extent does this have to be shown in the affidavit and the facts? To what, ex what sort of burden of proof is there on the plaintiff to make the showing and for the court to make that finding and issue the order, that's addressed in the second sentence of subsection B. You see, the plaintiff shall have the burden of proving abuse by a preponderance of the evidence. Now, that uh, is an issue that the committee has dealt with many times over the years, but I felt I should reiterate that now so that people can understand that concept. Um, Basically, what we're talking about here is the burden of proof, the, the standard of proof. And uh, there are three primary standards of proof uh, in the law. 
the preponderance of the evidence is the lowest one. The middle one is clear and convincing evidence. And the most, uh, or the most challenging, the most uh, one that requires the most proof is the uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So the proof beyond a reasonable doubt, I'm sure is familiar to everybody. That's the one that's used in criminal proceedings. Uh, whereas this one, preponderance of the evidence that you look, you're looking at now is used primarily is the primary one that's used in civil proceedings. That's uh, what's the default in civil proceedings is the preponderance. And what preponderance means is that it uh, it means, a I'm gonna read from uh, uh, some definition in Black's Law Dictionary and another treatise on evidence called McCormick on Evidence. It's a degree of evidence that while not sufficient to free the mind wholly from all reasonable doubt is still more convincing than the opposing evidence and is sufficient to incline a fair and impartial mind to one side of the issue rather than the other. This is the burden of proof used in most civil trials in which the jury is instructed to find for the party that on the whole has the stronger evidence, however slight the edge may be. Now that's an important point, however slight, because sometimes sort of uh, this standard, the preponderance standard, when you're talking about percentages, some people refer to it as 51% to 49%. So in other words, if 51% of the evidence seems like it favors one side as opposed to the other, and even if 49% of the evidence favors the other side, that still would satisfy the preponderance standard. So as I just said, uh, the language from McCormick, it's whoever has the stronger evidence, however slight the edge may be. So that's the preponderance standard that you see that's used here uh, in the RFA statute. Uh, just so you know, for background, as well, going forward, clear and convincing is sort of a middle tier. That is something that the legislature sometimes uses as a matter of policy when they it can put in statutes uh, when it wants a burden of proof to be higher, when it wants it to be something more than 51% to 49%, for example. It wants there to be a higher standard, a higher requirement of proof that needs to be brought. The legislature does that sometimes and puts that in statute. Again, uh, reading from uh, an articulation of what the standard is, clear and convincing evidence means evidence indicating that the thing to be proved is highly probable or reasonably certain. Pick up that highly probable or reasonably certain. This is stronger evidence than a preponderance, the standard applied in most civil trials, but less evidence than beyond a reasonable doubt, the standard for criminal trials. So that gives you a sense of clear and convincing. And lastly, beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, this is articulated as fully satisfied entirely convinced, satisfy to a moral certainty, and in my favorite term, indubitable. So, <laughs> so that's from, uh, that's also from Black Law Dictionary. So that gives you a sense of, of what they are. And again, referring back to the statute, it's preponderance that's used for purpose, purposes of the RFA. Eric, if I may. Yes. Yeah, on the, on, uh, the language here, uh, the law, no, I just lost it. <laughs> oh, there it is. Uh, for a prepon a pre preponderance of evidence. So uh, concerning an RFA, if, if, the, if there is a, uh, th that 51% you talk about, is, is it uh, a may or a shall as far as the judge goes for a, an RFA? Uh, I think I, I understand you, Representative Berta. Are you saying that or asking that the, the, it is a shall in the sense that the court has to find that the plaintiff has met their burden of proof by a preponderance of the evidence? If the plaintiff does not satisfy the preponderance of the evidence standard, then the relief from abuse order can't be, cannot be issued because the, the evidentiary threshold has not been met. Okay. Is that is that answer your question? Definitely. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Um, all right. So that's actually uh, concludes what I wanted to say about the final order. Remember, this is all to do with the final relief from abuse order. So again, uh, this is only one of two possible RFAs. This is the final order that uh, can be issued for as long as the court determines. Uh, but there's also, as we saw in the accept language above about how generally speaking, there has to be notice and an opportunity for the defendant to be heard, except for what? Remember it said, except for section 1104, which is where we are now. So this is the 1104, this is emergency relief. Again, a temporary order. This is uh, 
when the order can be issued without the presence of the defendant. You see the language, um, very first sentence, in accordance with the rules of civil procedure, temporary orders under this chapter may be issued ex parte. And language is right there. Uh, remember, that's, that's from one side only, one party only, without notice to the defendant. Upon motion and findings by the court, the defendant has abused the plaintiff or both. So remember, there's still that component of the required findings. That's the same as in the, in the final one. Has to, be, has to be a finding here <clears throat> that the defendant has abused the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children in the past. Again, similarly, the second sentence, there has to be a, an affidavit. <clears throat> and there's that other language about uh, proceedings for a minor that's uh, in the last sentence there. But a key, a key difference here, again, you'll see in subdivision one, moving down just a little bit, this finding is different because here it says, upon a finding that there is an immediate danger of further abuse. Everybody see that? That word immediate is not in the final order statute that we just looked at. So that gives you the sense that this is an emergency situation, right? That's, this is different. You can only issue this emergency order without the presence of the defendant if there's an immediate danger of further abuse. And the court has to find that, again, by the, the preponderance of the evidence. So the findings in this case have to be, number one, uh, there was abuse against the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children. That's the same as in the final order. Those two are the same. But number two, which is different, there's an immediate danger of further abuse. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so if the court makes those two findings, again, you'll see, as we looked at above, there's this list of things that can be in the order, uh, in this final temporary relief from abuse order. You'll see, and there's one, two, three, and one has several components, but there's, uh, again, refrain from abusing the plaintiff. I'm in 1A. Um, uh, or the plaintiff's children, uh, subdivision B, refrain from interfering with the plaintiff's personal liberty, uh, subdivision C, coming, refrain from coming within a fixed distance of the plaintiff. You'll see that frequently in uh, RFAs, for example, a person can't come within however many feet of the, of the plaintiff, and no contact orders, you see again, are in subdivision D. Moving on to two and three, uh, there's other things that can be in the order. The um, the order can contain, uh, if there's a finding that the plaintiff or children have been, have been forced out of the household, then there can be this uh, component included in the order that the uh, a vacate order that I mentioned earlier, that can also be in the final one, court may order the defendant to vacate, that's the last line of subdivision two. And subdivision three also uh, provides for, uh, if there's a finding of immediate danger of physical or emotional harm, temporarily awarding custody of the children uh, to the plaintiff. So you see that one, two, three, correct? That there can be in there. I'd say that because <clears throat> now that segues us perfectly into H-133. Because what H-133 does is it adds a number four to that list. You see, it goes one, two, three. This is existing law in the emergency order situation. And I'm going to try and see if I can switch now right to the bill. Um, let's see if I can do this. Um, all right, does everybody see the bill now? Hope that's a yes. Um, yes. So now we're yes. back looking at, okay, good. <laughs> uh, now we're back looking at, this is the statute we were just looking at, um, except th this is the bill now. So this is where the proposal is to change that statute. Again, we already looked at this language just now when we were looking at existing law here at subsection A. This is about the the emergency order and what can be in it and uh, how it has to, how it can be issued, sorry, without notice to the defendant if there's um, a finding that there has been abuse in the past and that there's uh, an immediate danger of further abuse. And remember, we saw an, exist an existing law, there's components that can be in the order, in the order, and they were numbered one, two, three. And the proposal of H-133 is to add another one, subdivision four. And this says that, okay, that final emergency re relief from abuse order uh, can include an additional provision. And that is, as you'll see in line five, page two, that the or an order issued under the section may, if the plaintiff's complaint or affidavit includes information that the defendant possesses, owns, or controls firearms. So that has to be in the affidavit. Remember, the, the uh, plaintiff has to file an affidavit with their complaint under this RFA procedure. So if the plaintiff's complaint includes that information in the affidavit and line seven, 
the court finds it necessary to protect the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children. So the court has to make that finding as well, that it's necessary for protection. Uh, if those two, two preconditions are met, then line eight uh, provides that the court can require the immediate relinquishment until the expiration of the order. Remember the order is only for 14 days uh, of all firearms that are in the defendant's possession, ownership or control, or that another person possesses or controls on behalf of the defendant. So uh, that's the proposal in H-133 to add that authority uh, to the court's ability when it makes, uh, when it issues an RFA order under this section, an emergency RFA, I should say, temporary one. Um, and uh, that's the proposal. I think that uh, kind of ends my explanation of what the current law is. And as I say, it sort of segued us right into uh, what the proposal is for change to the current law in H-133. Although I'll add as well that uh, in many ways it's a clarification uh, because as you'll hear from Judge Grierson, uh, there's at least uh, uh, an arguable basis that some, some courts are already viewing their inherent authority uh, to allow this uh, uh, to include it, to be included in the emergency final order, or sorry, the emergency temporary order as it is. Uh, but this clarifies the situation, removes any ambiguity that there may be about that uh, authority of the court going forward. So um, that's what I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm, I'm going to exit my screen sharing unless someone would prefer that I stay on it and look at language for a moment. Thank you, Eric. Uh, any? Sure. Yeah. There we go. Now I can see hands. Thank you. That, that was great. That was very really helpful. Uh, any questions for oh, Kate? I see your hand. And these are questions for Eric about the language. And then, okay, so we have Kate, Felicia, and Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a clarification the language in section four. Um, so if the plaintiff's complaint or affidavit includes information that the defendant possesses, owns or controls firearms and the court finds it necessary to protect the plaintiff or the plaintiff's child. So based on what you were just describing in terms of the law, is that, is that just sort of like a redundancy? Like if they were to give this order, they would, they would have determined that they were, um, that it was necessary to protect them or is that language unique to other language that's already in the law? No, I think it is it is particular uh, to that provision in that, uh, in other words, that, that, for example, the the language I think allows for the possibility that the defendant may have firearms in in their possession, uh, but that it may not be a situation where there is that immediate danger as a result of the firearms, and, and so the 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 uh, court would have to find both in order for it to, to issue the relinquishment order. Does that make sense as far as an answer? Yeah, so it's sort of, it's saying that, that, that both of these things would have to be, be found to be true, that the, the risk would be tied to the firearm is what you're saying exactly. in that particular section. Okay, yep, thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Again, Felicia and then Tom. Yeah, thank you. Um... So a couple of questions, um, starting with the most direct one. Uh, the last line and a half, uh, page two, line 10 and 11, where it's directing that firearms that are in the possession of somebody other than the defendant um, are required to be immediately relinquished. How broad is that? What's what's the total intent of scope there through sphere of influence? Right, I think the idea there is that, uh, um, you know, that to prevent a situation where, for example, someone has firearms, it's a dangerous situation, but the firearms say, but the person, um, you know, temporarily gives the firearms to another person. And so that they can say, uh, all right, well, I don't possess any firearms. They aren't, they aren't in my control, even though those may be the, per the, the, uh, 
the, that the uh, defendant may actually own those firearms, but they don't want them to be able to sort of evade the law essentially by temporarily housing them with somebody else. Okay, so they would have to be owned by the defendant and in the control of somebody else, not somebody else's owned firearms that the defendant might have access to with or without breaking the law. Yes, because yeah, I agree with that because of the last phrase on behalf of the defendant, yes. So that's still pretty ambiguous and in my opinion, um, I am willed firearms from my father's collection. Let's throw a hypothetical in there that other Vermonters have the same situation. They're not technically mine. They're not in my ownership until he dies. However, if that RFA were ever leveled against me and they required immediate relinquishment, those are his. Technically he's controlling them for me until he dies. Are those looped in? Are we looping in heirlooms? Are we looping in things that are not yet given, but there's an understanding that they will be? Where are we drawing the line on ownership? Is an FFL transfer the beacon of ownership or is it more tenuous than that? It's, it's really not defined here. So I'm looking to nail down exactly what the court order would be going after, especially for requiring relinquishment of things that are not actually into the defendant's possession or household. Yeah, that's an interesting, interesting legal question. Uh, it's, I wouldn't want to say that I have the answer to that off the top of my head, but, but yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, what, what about a, a situation like you described, where, where say ownership has not vested in in the recipient, whether as you say because of a trust or because of a will or perhaps because of a future transfer. Is that being controlled yet? Does that yet meet the definition of on behalf of the defendant? Um, it's an interesting question. Maybe the witnesses would have some, some information for that as well. And I, I can look into it, but I wouldn't want to say I have an answer to that right away. So that's, that's kind of my first question is I just think that entire um, control on, in, in the possession of another person is just far too broad and right. vague and leaves a, a lot of concern for me. Um, but my second question that kind of just ties to why we're, we're taking this up in the first place is if the court currently has such broad authority in statute. And as you mentioned a, a couple of moments ago, there are courts that believe they already have this authority. Why is this necessary? Well, I think I'll, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, to, I'll, I, I'll defer to the chair on that. Um, I think perhaps our, our um, witnesses um, can testify to that, especially Judge Grierson. Uh, that's really more of a question for, not, not so much for Eric, thank you. I'll hold that for the judge then. I don't know if Eric, if that's what you're gonna say or not, but go ahead, yeah. No, that's exactly right, then, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the final thing that's a question on, on, the, on the drafting um, specifically, it's just not specified, is who's responsible for relinquishment? Is it on the defendant's recognizance? Is they must be honest and turn things in? Who's doing a seizure of these? And uh, it, it's just not outlined. I believe this is an excerpt from a previous bill last session, H610, if I'm remembering correctly. And that had outlined who was doing the seizure and protocols. Um, but this has nothing to that effect. So I was wondering if that was an intentional leave out or? No, not on my part. I think it just assumed that for enforcement of the of court orders that uh, like with any other order that the, or any other component, I should say, of the, of the court's order that the authority is that the court can, because the would be ordering relinquishment that it can instruct a law enforcement officer to enforce the order. Um, but again, that's something that, that certainly if uh, you feel that needs clarification, we can always uh, propose amended language for that. Thanks. Uh, and then I, I guess just a final question for the chair and I'll hold the rest of mine for the appropriate witnesses. Are we going to be hearing from any law enforcement agencies regarding that kind of provision, their ability to execute such an order? Uh, we 
We can. You mean to execute just a, an order that's not covered here? Um, specifically related to relinquishment or seizure of firearms. There have been similar laws in other states that have wound up to be very, very deadly. And I would like to hear from our law enforcement as to um, their experience and what, what they would expect and what we, we would be charging them with. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Maxine, did you say Tom? I did. Okay. <laughs> no, I did. you broke up there for a second. Um, Eric, uh, going back to preponderance, um, there's preponderance and then uh, there's clear and convincing. What, what's, what's the one in the middle? No, clear and convincing is the one in the middle. The, oh, okay. the, most, the beyond a reasonable doubt is oh, the. That's right. Uh, okay. Okay. And, and this, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I was finished. Thanks. Okay. Um, and, and this question might not be for you. It might, I, I, I think it might be for the judge, but uh, kind of thinking out loud with, with the way it's working now with, it, uh, with preponderance or that, that's the, uh, um, the suggestion, I guess you could say, as far as re re relinquishing guns. Um, so some judges are some judges are doing it now, and uh, they they feel they have the authority, and some some judges don't. But um, so with preponderance of evidence, say you've got two judges, the same evidence in front of them, they could come to different conclusions. I, I'm assuming. Yeah, I think that's that's always possible, regardless of the type of proceeding. Yep, it's. Uh... You know, a close question, it's, that's right, always right. a possibility. Yes, yeah, so, so it's going through my mind, say the judge that uh, doesn't um, think that there's a, uh, uh, that it meets a preponderance is kind of in their mind, that I got to believe that they're thinking more uh, clear and convincing. And it, I just don't like the idea of, of, of pushing the judges that don't believe, um, you know, that a, a level is met to uh, to the re, re, relinquishing the firearms thing, but but again, that may be more toward the judge. But what have we in the past? I know we've talked about storage, um, you know, on confiscated firearms. Uh, can you remind me? Have we done anything as far as uh, putting in statute that law enforcement agencies have to have storage? Uh, yes, at least they not so much have to, but yes, you've provided, remember you created the ability of law enforcement to have uh, storage for, and to get some, <coughs> I think to have some uh, storage spaces. Uh, I'll, I'll double check on this, but I thought there was an appropriation for some storage as well. But yes, there, there is uh, elsewhere in statute, some provision made for storage. Right. Um, yeah, but I, I think that's st there's still an issue of whether or not sufficient storage exists, if that's kind of what you're getting at. Well, and that's exactly where I'm going, say, you know, mm -hmm. with say an antique firearm that, uh, you know, that somebody is going to keep under, you know, temperature and humidity um, uh, uh, levels or whatever, you know, to preserve them right, you know, just things like that. Even a regular firearm, I mean, if it's not in the right uh, storage, I mean, you know, there's a chance of it. Uh, you know, corroding and, and that type of thing. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm just having trouble with with the um, um, the preponderance piece on this. Uh, it just seems like it's, to me, it's not strong enough. I mean, at a minimum, it should be clear and convincing uh, in, in my opinion. But, um, but anyway, that's, I'm kind of, rambling and thinking out loud, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, sir, that's a policy decision for the committee, certainly. Yes, yep. thanks. Sure. Yeah, and we can speak to uh, DPS commissioner about storage. I know that uh, in the past, he, he said that that was something that was one of his priorities and that uh, he was certainly taken care of and uh, we'll be seeing him tomorrow, so. If we have time, we can ask him about it. And if not, we can get him back in. 
Right. And Maxine, do you think he it just came to my mind? I mean, it's a emergency relief is for two weeks, but uh, and maybe Eric or you can can answer it. I'm just wondering what the procedure would be to get, say, if it was me to get my firearms back. I mean, are we talking, uh, you know, I mean, state, you know, with governments and paperwork, sometimes it can be quite burdensome. And uh, I'm just wondering if it's going to take, say, take me another week or two to to get my firearms back or if it's just automatic. I can't answer that. I don't know, Eric, if you can, or if that's um, again, something for one of the witnesses. I don't think there's anything in, in the language about the procedure. Uh, though it does say that the order can only be for relinquishment for as long as the order is in effect. Uh, so it, it gives a time frame for how long the relinquishment can be in effect, but it doesn't say anything about the procedure for getting it back. So that might be something the witnesses would have more information about. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Eric? Okay, great. So I'm going to now turn to Judge Gerson, and uh, we'll be late for our break. I would like to give Judge Gerson an um, opportunity to testify. Um, thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank the chair and the committee for inviting me to uh, testify today on H133. Um, for the record, Brian Grierson, uh, Chief Superior Judge and before I get into uh, th this bill, um, I, I think just to respond to some of the questions I've already heard, the, the provisions for uh, storage of, of firearms are in other parts of the statute. Uh, th there are essentially three uh, vehicles, if you will, for doing that. One is we can order firearms to be surrendered to the uh, police officer who is serving an order on the defendant. Um, if there is a firearms, uh, registered certified firearms dealer available, they can be stored there. Um, or if the individual has a uh, family member or friend who they would want to hold the firearms, there is a process for doing that. I won't go into details on those, but uh, the reason they're not in this bill is because they're in other parts of, of the statute. And the issue that uh, Representative Burdett and, and um, raised on storage is an ongoing issue. I mean, the statute provides for surrender, but um, the storage issue is a continuing one. But I, I'd, I'd like to go back, be, uh, and Representative Burdett mentioned the, the burden of proof. What I think is important for the committee to understand is that this suggested amendment um, is not creating anything new. It is not creating a new cause of action. It's not creating a new form of relief. The purpose behind this bill, and there is a long history here, it does go back, one of the uh, uh, representatives mentioned H610. I mean, this, this bill or that's before you now has evolved certainly over the last a year or more that it's been discussed and it, and it has taken different uh, variations in, in the wording up until this point. But I don't want the committee to think that we're all of a sudden changing or adding um, a burden uh, because by far the majority of judges have believe uh, that they have the inherent authority under the current law to order, and in fact do order, relinquishment and non-possession of firearms on a temporary order. Um, and, and the source of that, uh, Eric, in his uh, recitation, to go back to um, Section 1103, says the court shall make order... Judge. Excuse Judge, me. Here, 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 here. I, I'm yeah. sorry. Can't hear you. Yeah. Le leaning too far away. Right. Court, uh, this is in uh, 1103 C1. The court shall make such orders as it deems necessary to protect the plaintiff or the children or both if the court finds that the defendant has abused the plaintiff. That, that is a broad 
scope of authority. Um, and when you look at, for instance, the um, order that we can issue under 1104, under section one, A1, it says, upon a finding that there is immediate danger of further abuse, an order may be granted requiring the defendant. And then it lists A, B, C, D. If you look at those things, they include a refrain from coming within a fixed distance, refrain from contacting the plaintiff. These are all forms of relief. This provision about relinquishing firearms or non-possession of firearms could very easily be paragraph E in that section. Because what we have the authority to do now, as I indicated, is to, is to order relinquishment or non-possession of firearms during this period between the temporary order and the final hearing. This bill has been discussed, and at least from our, our perspective, it's an attempt to codify, uh, or if you will, clarify what we can already do. And my concern, and the concern of many judges um, are that in an attempt to codify or clarify, you may be limiting the discretion the court already has. And that is a significant concern uh, for the court. And because we believe now that we do have this authority, we think it's an important authority. We think it's an important exercise of discretion for the very reasons uh, that I've stated uh, for the protection um, of the plaintiff and or uh, family members of the plaintiff. And so I don't want the committee to think that this is, um, when we talk, for instance, about the burden of proof, I, I, I agree that that's, that's a, a um, question the committee may want to look at, but the burden of proof shouldn't be any different for the relief that's being sought in this bill than it, than it is for the overall granting of a relief from abuse order. Um, in other words, the relief from abuse order is where the burden falls. The burden falls on the plaintiff to prove that by a preponderance of evidence. And, you know, someone mentioned, or Eric, I believe mentioned, you know, if it's 51 to 49, the key words that Eric brought up with respect to the burden of proof are however slight. So when you think of the think of the the image, if you will, of the scales of justice, um, if they tilt in just the least little bit, that is a preponderance of evidence. It's whatever tips that scale. And I've used the term, and I think one of the witnesses is going to. Uh, pick up on what I said, you can think of it as uh, the weight of a feather. If that's all it takes to tip the scale, there's no magic to 5149. It's that tipping of the scale, however slight the evidence is. And the court often finds itself in considering the evidence before it that the plaintiff has not met that burden. Uh, it's not every single uh, case that is filed is granted. I don't, I, ha I don't have the numbers for you and I should get them for you, um, Madam Chair, so that the committee understands that um, th this, there's a process of requesting temporary orders. Some are granted, some are denied. Uh, most of these are, are requested after court hours. So they're usually late night phone calls to the judges, but a significant number of those orders are denied. Um, the next step is the final hearing. It has to be held within 14 days. Every court has a specific day of the week when they uh, schedule relief from abuse orders. So they are heard uh, certainly within that 14 days. Um, and at that final hearing, uh, the, the, the plaintiff still has the burden of proof. Even if they've been granted a temporary order based on an affidavit, they have to offer testimony and evidence at the final hearing um, and satisfy the court by preponderance of evidence that they're entitled to the relief they're requesting. 
the relief they're requesting is that they're, the, the proof is that they have uh, been abused or there's a threat of immediate abuse. Um, and all these things that you see in section uh, 1104 under Roman numeral, uh, under one, A through D are things that the court can order. You don't have to prove that someone needs to be um, out of the house by a preponderance of evidence. The preponderance of evidence goes to whether or not they're entitled to relief. And then the court has the discretion to fashion the relief that is warranted in a given case. And in some cases, uh, there is evidence before the court of firearms. There is evidence that firearms have been used in an incident that brings the, the person to the court. There are cases where there's evidence of uh, uh, ownership or possession of firearms, but maybe they weren't used in the incident uh, that is before the court. Maybe they have been used in the past. And there are situations where um, there may be no reference uh, either in the affidavit or complaint um, or in the plaintiff's testimony about the existence of firearms or the use of firearms. But based on all of the evidence before us, and this is more in the final hearing, um, when people have an opportunity to testify, that the, uh, the evidence of the, the potential for lethality is so great that even if firearms are not part of that specific case or that incident, the relief the court can grant is to order a relinquishment of firearms or non-possession of firearms. Um, and so I, I, the, the committee in looking at this bill has to understand that this is just another element of relief uh, that the court can grant. And the, the reason I am suggesting that that grant of discretion should be broad is because every case is different and the circumstances of every case before the court are different and the relief granted in one case may not be the same as in another. And so when I look at this bill and I will tell you that, that um, I have spent a considerable amount of time uh, looking at this bill, the various wording, the variations in the language, it's been reviewed by um, the judges. <clears throat> this is not a review that I do on my own. Um, I've and when I do that, and I do that with every bill that comes before a committee, there are some bills that get the attention of judges um, and I get a large response. There are others that I get little or no response. This is a bill uh, that I've received a lot of uh, response from judges and it has come in, um, quite frankly, <laughs> shortly before the, the hearing. In other words, it's still coming in. As early as six o'clock this morning, I was exchanging uh, emails with judges about this bill, because the concern that I hear from judges is that although this is a, um, a worthwhile attempt to codify what we're doing, the what we can do already, um, and, and let me explain why I think some judges struggle with it. As I mentioned, there, there's different circumstances, different facts of how firearms come into play in these proceedings. And some judges feel that unless there is a reference um, uh, in an affidavit or, or a complaint or in the testimony to firearms, the presence of firearms, the use of firearms in this incident or the history, if there's no evidence before them, then some judges do not feel they have uh, the authority uh, under the statute to, uh, to confiscate or, or re order a relinquishment of firearms or non-possession of firearms. Other judges feel that you don't have to have that information in front of you to warrant that kind of relief um, because of the, 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 the facts that come before them. And so in looking at this bill, if I can find my copy of it, um, just give me a second here. I think there are three, I guess I'm going to say th three options that the, the committee ought to consider. 
And this is truly a policy decision uh, on, on the part of, of, of the committee. So if you look at the language that um, is before you under uh, section four, the concern that is expressed by many judges are that when you, in the beginning of that uh, section, it talks about if the plaintiff's complaint or affidavit includes information that the defendant possesses, owns, or controls firearms, and the court finds it's necessary to protect the plaintiff. Uh, many judges are concerned because they feel that by referencing uh, the complaint and affidavit uh, and the firearms in either of those documents, that that would limit their authority to order a relinquishment or possession if, if it's not in the, the, the affidavit or complaint. So they, they're concerned that this could be limiting their, the authority that they now have. Um, so there, there's one suggestion that has been made, um, and that is, uh, if, you were, if you're going ahead with this language, if you feel this is what you, you feel is appropriate, and this is the policy, uh, you have to be concerned that you may be limiting the judge's discretion. There has been some suggestion that in addition to the language, if the plaintiff's complaint or affidavit includes information that the defendant possesses, owns, or controls firearms, or has uh, threatened uh, the use of a firearm, you could add that language and that may encompass a broader use of firearms. But there's still a concern that the it, even the addition of that language is, is limiting discretion. So the other approach you could use is to eliminate the reference to the, the information in the plaintiff's complaint or affidavit so that the, the uh, amendment would read an order issued under this section If the court finds it necessary to protect the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children, the court could require the immediate relinquishment uh, and so forth. In other words, eliminate that reference to the information just being available in a complaint or affidavit. So it clearly says if the court finds uh, that it's necessary or uh, to protect the plaintiff or their children, they could order relinquishment. And that would, that would remove, I think, an obstacle uh, to the court exercising the discretion it has now. In, in my view, if you were going that route, <clears throat> you could actually take that language and put it under section E, um, add it as a section E under 1104, because all it is is another form of uh, relief that the court uh, can order. Um, and I think it would be as appropriate there as it would be in another paragraph. And I guess the other point I would make is that if you didn't do anything, if you said this amendment is not necessary, the court would continue to address these issues in the way it does now. Um, and that is, we, we believe the statute provides that inherent authority. If you truly want clarification of the court's authority to add this, then I think the play, it, it, it's to make it simple um, and not complicated by adding it as a section E that merely includes it in the possibility of other relief the court already has, uh, that already can grant. And so it would fall under, uh, in a given case, it may be appropriate, it may not be, but it would allow the court uh, to then consider each case uh, on the facts that are presented. Um, and oftentimes <clears throat> uh, what we find is that, um, I understand that, as I said, most of these orders are um, issued after court hours um, under significant, um, oftentimes traumatic situations, but certainly periods of stress. And, an individual may not want to include in an affidavit um, 
that they the, the existence of firearms, but the circumstances that the court has been made aware of uh, in the mind of, of the court feels that th this situation is potentially uh, so dangerous that they think that a firearm should be relinquished or the defendant should not be possessing firearms during this uh, relatively brief period. And that's the concern. Um, and and I, I will say that um, I've spoken with representatives from uh, the domestic violence. I've worked closely with Sarah Robinson on, on, on this bill. And I've also um, spoken with um, Chris Bradley, who I think is testifying later this morning. Um, and discuss this bill with them. And I know I've received emails from, from Bill Moore and a phone call from uh, Tim Meehan. And I guess the information and in the position I'm sharing with the committee now is not one I've discussed in any detail with, with these folks because I have just found that this issue, uh, the closer it got to uh, this hearing, uh, the more input I was getting uh, from judges expressing uh, their views. Um, and so I, this, I, I don't think this issue needs to be complicated. If you're looking at, um, I'll, I'll go back and I don't wanna repeat myself, but um, when we start talking about the burden of proof, you really need to be talking about the burden of proof for the underlying relief that's requested, not just an individual. Uh, and that relief is the, 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 the threat of either physical harm or or abuse that has occurred, uh, not an individual um, request that the court can grant to make the situation safe. That's not where the preponderance of evidence it comes into play. Um, and so you don't wanna confuse um, the issues as to how that comes into play. Whether the committee wants to undertake a review of, of that standard uh, is entirely in, in your hands. Um, but there shouldn't be a separate standard uh, for a firearm relinquishment than there is for any other relief that we grant. And in fact, we, as I've said more than once this morning, we can grant that relief now um, with or without this statute. So um, some of my testimony may uh, come um, as a surprise, perhaps even to Sarah or to uh, Chris or any of the others. I'm glad to discuss this further with them as this moves along, but, um, I think there are ways that uh, this this authority can be clarified without limiting it, and that's that's really the concern that I have right now. So I I, I will stop, uh, but obviously uh, we'll answer any questions. Great, thank thank you very much. I appreciate that. And as you were talking, it, it did seem to me that maybe moving it to E does does make more sense. So I, I appreciate you. Addressing that. Uh, okay, so I see Barbara, Selena, and then Felicia. Thank you. Good so morning. Judge, good morning. So you started to say, which is a question that I'm trying to ask with every bill we're doing, and you started to say it, but I'm not positive you fully finished because you um, got into another interesting issue of what the problem is that this bill is addressing. I understand it to be that we're trying to codify something, but that's more what we're doing. And I heard some judges are interpreting it one way right now and some another in terms of feeling like they have the authority. So that, I guess that's my first question. I have a sort of a second question based on the answer to this, but. I mean, I, I can't tell you why uh, a specific judge uh, would rule one way or another. I, as I gather uh, comments from judges, um, some of them, um, I think some of them, it, it's fair to say that if, if evidence is not, uh, let me put it this way, if the affidavit uh, doesn't have any reference to firearms either in the incident that brings the person there or a uh, history um, on a temporary basis. Uh, some judges will say, I'm not going to order uh, confiscation. Another judge may. So it's not a question of, of the authority. Oftentimes it's the evidence that comes before them. And so I think if you add this as a 
method of relief, the judge can still make that decision. It doesn't mean that every time this, a, a, a case is filed, it's going to be uh, ordered, relinquished. If you remember going back, and I, when I talked about the evolution of this bill, if you remember right, right. some of our very early discussions was the idea, if we granted a temporary order, that it would be mandatory relinquishment of firearms, whether there was no, uh, whether there was any uh, evidence or not. And so right. that's where we started and now we've evolved over that right, time right, right. to this, but that's the reason it, it's. Um, Thank you, that's helpful. So here's my, fo here's my follow up question. Would it make sense to have it, like you proposed a solution which sounded good, but I was wondering before you had proposed that, if the legislation, assuming it passes, would say, um, if not mentioned in the affidavit, the judge will inquire because like, don't we wanna just be sure? Like it doesn't. So let, let me suggest this. Remember these are coming in after hours, late night calls and they are based strictly on the affidavit and complaint filed by the individual. We do not have a contact with the individual. In other words, there's a, there's a uh, I'll call them court staff. For the most part now, they are contracted. They're the ones that contact us and say, we have uh, an affidavit complaint. So we don't talk with the, with, with the plaintiff. That, okay, that makes sense. And I want to say, that I had a chance to sit in on um, relief from abuse order day when the ABA did the open uh, visit your court day. And it was, inc it was incredibly eye-opening in terms of the variation of cases. Like, I think I sat in on four and it was remarkable. You know, I highly recommend our committee try to do that. It's, um, so could an affidavit have a little box saying our firearms are like could it there be a so, just so we're not like having something slip and, and I, I should have mentioned this before we have a, a standing judiciary committee it's we have one for every division family criminal civil and so forth the family oversight committee is currently reviewing our complaint form and affidavit that will address these issues um, it's, it's up to the plaintiff, obviously, whether they check the box or fill in the blanks, but there will be more, um, more information available to the judges on this issue, on the, the, whether or not firearms uh, were used in the incident, um, whether the person knows what they are or how many or the type. So there'll be more information already. And that's why I'm saying that um, the, the bill as it reads now, um, whether or not that clause is in there about information in the complaint or affidavit, it's going to be there. So it will be up to the judge to decide based on that complaint or affidavit, whether there's a basis in their mind uh, to, to order uh, relinquishment. So um, th those forms are being addressed. That's great. And you had mentioned also getting us the date on how many were um, denied and how many were accepted, which would be helpful. I mean, it would just be helpful to have some information on that. And I like the idea of some, I mean, not like we're trying to go fishing for guns. I mean, that's sort of a weird <laughs> metaphor there, but, um, but somebody who just experienced a highly traumatic situation may not be thinking super clearly about everything. And you wouldn't want someone to go afterwards, oh my gosh, I forgot about the gun that, you know, whatever. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Selena and then Felicia. Uh, thanks. I, I appreciate the um, thought about moving that to the section E2. I th think that makes a lot of just structural sense. Um, I just wanted to, so my understanding of part of why um, getting more explicit about this possibility for judges 
in in statute is useful is that it might create more consistency in our sort of quest for geographic justice justice and just assurance for judges across the board that um, this is available to them. And so you said at the start of your testimony, most judges believe they already have um, this ability. And then you also noted that if we didn't pass anything, the ability would still be there. But I'm, I'm, wonder if you can talk about that question of most judges versus all well, judges. I can, but I, you know, I, I don't have an exact count. I, what I'm saying is in my experience has been that um, when I say most judges, I think by far the an overwhelming number of the judges believe they have this authority. Um, I have not had a judge tell me that they didn't think they had the authority it depends on the facts that are before them. And that, that's the difficulty in answering that question is that, um, as I said before, some judges, if they, if there's not some reference, either in the affidavit or the complaint, or, uh, you know, in the plaintiff's uh, statement to the court about guns, then it's not that they don't feel they have the authority under the statute necessarily, but they don't think that that is a situation that warrants it. So this would just uh, identify the fact that this is, to me, it's the reason I think it fits under E, and, and I'm probably going a little bit away from your question, is that uh, when you're thinking about the safety of the individuals, and that's what all those things, and in, in, when you get, when you start reading those sections, A through D, that's what they are. You've already determined that the person uh, has proven their case, and so you're trying to tailor the relief that this individual needs. And so by adding this relinquishment or non-possession, I think it's important to remember uh, they may not have firearms in their presence. You, you don't want them to go out and purchase. So relinquishment or non-possession, um, but, but there it is as an option. And if the, if the facts fit, um, then it's there for the judge uh, to order it. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's so much, I've said lack of authority. It's not in the statute. So the discussion I've had with judges is that, well, it doesn't specifically say it in the statute, but we believe we have the inherent authority. And this is not unique. I, I don't want anyone to think this is unique to, to um, uh, relief from abuse or this particular statute. There are many situations where the court exercises its inherent authority in, in fashioning relief. So th this, is not, um, this is not a way to, to um, single out uh, firearms um, as an issue. It's just, it's just this, is, this is what we see in these cases. And sometimes it's an elevated risk because of the presence of firearms. Sometimes it's an elevated risk even without that presence but it may be appropriate in fashioning relief to say, well, I haven't heard that there's firearms, but this situation appears to me to be so uh, potentially dangerous that I'm going to make sure the individual doesn't have access to firearms in this. Remember, this is a temporary order. It could be done in less than a week. Um, and, and then the order goes away. What happens in that week is of course the final hearing. And that's when, if a final order is granted, then by federal law, they're not entitled to possess firearms anyway. So remember, this is we're talking about temporary relief. Hopefully, that answers your question. But if not, go ahead and try. Yeah, and no, I think I think I think so. I mean, what I'm what I am trying to get at, I guess, is that I I hope that we can find sort of the balance in constructing this where um, you all in the judiciary feel really clear that we're not limiting your power in any way. I think that that's the last intention, you know, here, but that we are also making it really clear that that power exists and that the legislature recognizes that's why it. I, well, I, I, so hopefully we can get there. Yeah, that's why I think putting it under adding a section E, just offering it as a relinquishment or non-possession is the, the most straightforward way of saying this is just another form of relief. There's 
may or may not apply in a given case. That's not mandated. It's still within the court's discretion, like all the other things in that particular list. Um, that makes sense to me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Felicia and then Ken. Thank you, Judge. Um, Good so morning. I have a couple questions for you. And the first thing that kind of sparked um, my, my interest was you said that judges feel like they have the authority now. Has there been a case that you can kind of point to where this has been ordered in, in current practice? Oh, I, I know there have. I can't point to a specific case, but I'm in, in, in uh, reviewing this particular bill with judges. I mean, I'm hearing from judges that they do order this. And that's, that's why they're concerned that the way the bill is worded now, they're concerned that it will limit the authority that they have been exercising. I mean, I'm sure over the course of time, it's been a while since I've sat in this docket, but I'm sure I ordered it in the appropriate case. There is currently in uh, what's interesting, and don't ask me how it got there, but in the existing temporary order form that we use, uh, even though it's not in the complaint about firearms, there is a provision in there that, that allows for the relinquishment of firearms to the serving officer. I forget the exact wording, but it's already pre-printed in the uh, uh, interim uh, temporary order so that um, that the judges know that it's available. I think, and, and I don't want to confuse the issue when I say they don't have authority. I think it's the specific facts. Um, okay, so before them. that kind of leads to some follow-up questions that I hope just add clarity um, to the assertion that this is already something that courts have the authority to do. So digging into definition a little bit, um, relinquishment is the word that keeps coming up, not seizure. Is it relinquishment or when they serve the RFA, do they have a warrant attached to that to search the home and, and seize any firearms that come across? Or is it upon the defendant's own relinquishment? How is that played out in case? You know, that, that's a topic that has, uh, Certainly, this committee has discussed before that, that that's part of the problem with with the statute says says relinquishment. I think the form order now says that guns will be turned over uh, to the serving officer. Um, remember, again, these are after hours, so when the police get this order, they go to serve it. Um, I I cannot tell you, and I would be surprised if any. Uh, police officer obtained a, a warrant because you only get a warrant if there's a crime. And um, in other words, if there's evidence of a crime, that's what a search warrant does. Um, so they wouldn't really wouldn't have a basis to get a search warrant in advance of serving the order. And they may, may or may not have one after. So they go to the serving, uh, they go to the uh, uh, residence where the individual is located and ask for a surrender of firearms. And, and, an ongoing issue when you talk about um, this subject is um, to what extent can law enforcement um, enforce or can anyone enforce the, the order of relinquishment? Um, it, it, so that, that helps on clarity, um, but just crystal clear is an RFA, serving an RFA does not come with authority to enter the domicile no. and go looking for guns. No. Okay. So next point is storage capacity. Um, you had mentioned that it would be on the serving officer just to keep it at the storage available at their station. Um, I, have, I, I, my, I have to tell you that I don't have a lot of information on storage. I know that for individual you know, your local police departments, uh, it's, a, it's a very big issue for storage capacity and the ability to store. I believe, and I, and I don't know for sure, but I believe the funding that may have been referenced earlier probably went to the state police uh, and they might have some kind of central storage, but I really don't even know how a local police department might be able to access that storage. So the storage of firearms is, is an ongoing and a difficult issue all the way around. 
Yeah, I, I, I do recall it being a, a statewide issue back a it couple of years as well. So uh, moving forward on, on just kind of feeding off of the nebulous around storage is who carries the responsibility for damage. Let's say I have heirloom pieces. They need specific humidity. They need specific storage. Um, if that doesn't exist, if they're relinquished or seized, who bears the responsibility for damage to property in that 14 day period? So all I can tell you is that that would be asking me for my legal opinion as to who is responsible and, and that I cannot uh, give you. It, I mean, it's just not our policy to offer an opinion. It, it, I will tell you that it is a significant issue uh, both for law enforcement, who's ever storing these firearms, whether it's law enforcement, the firearms dealer, or, or the, the neighbor or friend who's holding these under an, an order. Um, but I think some of the folks who will be testifying later can probably give you more information on that than I can. I can only tell you that the, the question you raise is one that has been raised a number of times. So liability becomes an ongoing question. I respect best, I, opinion, best I can do. Opinion. I, I appreciate the answer. Um, and then because I'm just trying to get the idea of the process here, um, hearing from you that the, these are and in fact done, um, that 14 day temporary or order period, is it an automatic hearing at the end of the 14 days um, or is for, the, for the firearms to be returned? Or is it a separate hearing separate from the RFA entirely? So what happens is when someone is issued a temporary order uh, after hours, um, depending on which court it is, um, for instance, uh, the, the Chittenden court, um, anyone living in Chittenden County, they have a relief from abuse morning every uh, Thursday uh, morning. Um, and so up to a certain point within that 14 days, uh, if you're issued a temporary order, your order will tell you that there is a final hearing scheduled on X date uh, within that 14 days. Um, and, and that day may vary from courthouse to courthouse, but every court has the same system. So that when you get that order as a, as a defendant, um, you have the date and time of your final hearing. And so it's at that final hearing, if at that final hearing, uh, either the plaintiff doesn't show or the plaintiff does not meet the burden of proof that we discussed earlier and the petition is dismissed, they're entitled to get their firearms back as soon as the order is dismissed. Um, I think Representative Burdett raised the question of how long does it take? Well, it, it really depends at that point. Did they surrender firearms? Did they surrender them to the serving officer? Is that a local police department or state police? So I'm sure that varies, but the reality is once that uh, temporary order is dismissed, um, then they're entitled to get their firearm back. Uh, if at the result of that final hearing, a final order is granted, they will not get the firearms back. Okay, so that feeds a couple questions. I would love to get more in-depth testimony from perhaps, and I, and I don't know if it's possible, it would just kind of pipe dream, um, a judge that has issued uh, an, an order of this manner and kind of the related involvement of how it went out. I think if we're going to codify something that has precedent, I would like to know how the precedent works. And there are so many questions about storage and liability and simple operation that really seem outstanding for me. So with respect to the storage and those liability questions, I don't think you're going to get any better answer than you're going to get from me in terms of that. Once we issue the order, we're generally not involved in what happens with that firearm unless the, the, the individuals come back sometimes to say that they've lo identified someone who will store the guns for them. And then there is a separate proceeding whereby the court will approve that person for storage. But if they, if the firearms, if the order says, turn them over to the uh, police officer, um, that's, that our order is the end of our involvement with that issue, unless some party brings it back to us in some fashion. So 
judges will have very little information about where the firearm is stored. Um, okay, I appreciate that. I think I'm looking for testimony. Maybe it'll come from a, a, a different uh, person involved in the, maybe serving the order. Um, I, I would ex expect I other questions. So I'm going to hold okay. it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Before I go to uh, Tom and uh, Bob, Eric, I just want to give you an opportunity if you have, I'm hearing the questions, if you have anything. Um, to add at this point, if not, that's okay. But just wanted to circle back with you. Uh, no, I can I can uh, add at least one one point in response to one of uh, Representative uh, Leffler's questions, and this sort of has to do, I think, with press the precedent point. Uh, the there is a case that the Vermont Supreme Court decided in two thousand one called Benson v. Muscari, and I can send everyone the site or the case. And in that case, what the court held was that the, that the language in 1104 that I reviewed and that uh, Judge Gerson mentioned as well, that language that says that the court can make um, any orders that it deems necessary to protect the plaintiff or the children or both. Remember that, that broad language we talked about? that that language um, does permit the court to prohibit the defendant from possessing firearms. So it was a very specific question and the court answered it in that case. I think the issue is that that, that the, the reason that there may still be an ambiguity is that that language applies to the final order in 1104. It doesn't appear again in the temporary order in 1103. So if you look at what the, the what the language is in the temporary emergency order in 1103, before the sort of A, B, C, D pieces that people have been talking about, the introductory clause says, relief under this section shall be limited as follows. That same language doesn't appear in the, in the final uh, order. So one possible way of interpreting that is that that broad authority clause that that the Supreme Court said did include the ability to prohibit possession of firearms doesn't apply in the 1103 temporary order situation because it isn't there. It isn't that, that same language isn't there in, the, in 1103 it says it shall be limited. On the other hand, as Judge Gerson said, that's separate from the issue of the court's inherent authority. You know, the court may already ha may have the, and in many instances uh, is interpreted as having this inherent authority um, to prohibit possession of firearms, but that's a separate issue from sort of the statutory interpretation of the language. But I think it helps a little bit with what Representative Leffler and others have been asking, is there any precedent out there on this? And that's, that's one case that at least pretty squarely addresses that language in 1104. So it may be helpful. I can send it if folks want to look at it. I would love to see that, thank you. Thank you, uh, Tom and then Bob. Great, thank you. Uh, Judge, I, I, I think you said it is, if this, say if this uh, uh, bill passed as written, does it uh, potentially increase the number of uh, firearms that are gonna be confiscated or, or not confiscated, but um, impounded or, or whatever the term is? I, I don't see why it would. It wouldn't increase it? I, I don't see why it would. Others may disagree with me, but I, I, I don't see it as having an impact on, on the court, which I'm obviously usually testifying to, or an impact on, um, on um, uh, confiscation uh, because we have the authority now. Okay, but this would make it mandatory. No, 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 no. Oh. No, no, not at all. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. We have, as Eric pointed out, that's part of the, the, the rationale, if you will, for, for courts or judges believing they have the authority. This would still just be an option. It is not mandatory. It, the court would still exercise its discretion in a given case as to whether or not uh, relinquishment or non-possession is an appropriate relief for that case. That's why I'm suggesting that it go under that category. I think that's the most uh, 
appropriate place for it. And then the court may not feel that it is necessary or warranted by the facts, more importantly. It's not mandatory. The concern right now, Representative Burdett, is that the language as the bill is written would, would seem to many judges by far the majority to, to limit their their current discretion. And that's what they're concerned about. That in, in, the, in the committee or the legislature's attempt for clarification, they're really limit, li potentially limiting the discretion that we already have. Okay. Um, I mean, going back to storage, I guess, or, or uh, and I realize it's not in the bill, but I mean, um, it almost seems to me at, at this point, we need to look at storage again before we, before we do anything else to, to get a, a more detailed, uh, I guess, uh, statute around it or law around storage. But so the, the way, the way it works now, if, uh, if somebody, uh, has some of my guns, I, I get the emergency relief from abuse order. Uh, it's deemed that, you know, I, I need to give up my guns, um, if, if, again, if somebody else has possession of my guns, those need to be given up also, right? If they're your guns, they do. Okay, but then there is paperwork or, or there's a, um, a, a way to, uh, I guess I'll just say paperwork. There's paperwork that can be filled out uh, to, uh, to potentially make that same person the, yes. the, the keeper of those guns. Yes, that's why I was saying there's three options generally. Uh, police storage, law enforcement storage, uh, a federal firearms dealer, and there's only a few of them in the state that will, will... The problem there is that that may be the best alternative when you talk about liability and, and potential damage to guns. I, I think it's, some other witnesses will tell you that the best alternative is uh, the federal firearms dealers who know how to handle mm. firearms uh, right, and right, how right. to store them. But the third piece would be uh, those options aren't available for whatever reason, but they've come up with someone who they want uh, to hold firearms for them. That requires the court to approve of that person. There's a separate, usually a separate hearing because on the day that this order is issued, the final order, remember, the final order is what dictates the long-term storage of guns. Then um, then that becomes an issue and we would have a separate hearing usually on whether or not we approve a third party, if you will, to hold firearms for a person. Right. So that, that, that person that has my guns, uh, so they would, they would have to re, re, relinquish the guns and at a, a, another undetermined time, it could be determined that they can get them back. Well, there, if the final order is issued, uh, they're going to be prohibited from having the firearms anyway, and as long as the order remains in effect. Right, right. But, but what I'm saying, there is a situation where the, the firearms could be given back and forth. Not, not if they're under the terms of a final order. They cannot possess them under federal law. Right, but an emergency order, they, they would have to give up the guns. If, if that's what the court provides, yes. Right. And then at some other point uh, through the process, they it could be determined that they could store the guns. Yes, but the storage issue usually comes up in the context of a final hearing. Because remember, we issue, we'll say tonight I get the phone call and, and, I, and I order the, the relinquishment of firearms and they're to turn it over to the law enforcement because in the middle that's, of the night- That's the emergency order you're talking about yes. now? Yeah. Okay. So in other words, in the middle of the night, I, I, don't, I can't authorize a federal firearms dealer. I don't know who this person would approve. So the, the initial order invariably is going to say, turn them over to the, to the serving law enforcement officer. That person will be in court within you know, less, than, less than the two weeks normally. Uh, and that's when- uh, we would have a determination if they're going to continue to be uh, out of the, the person's possession, then what are we going to do for long-term storage? Right, right. But, but physically they could go from one person 
to re relinquishment and then back to the same person. I, I suppose, but they're, yeah. they, they, they're not going to, it's unlikely they're going to be able to get a hearing before the court on approval of a third person from the time the order is issued until that final hearing, because there's such a short time anyway, there wouldn't be time for another hearing. I, right. I'm just okay. saying as a, as a practical matter. Right, right, okay, thank you. Um, before I turn to Bob, um, just Gerson, there is a request um, to have a, um, a, a judge, an individual judge who has, um, who has ordered um, relinquishment um, come testify. Um, my understanding is that generally we, we don't hear from individual judges. Is that, is that's, that correct? And that's if that's generally the practice, yes. Okay. I mean, I'm, you know, if there are specific questions, uh, I'll try to answer them. Um, that's why I was saying the storage question is not one that it'll help to have someone else come in. Thank you. Uh, Bob. Thank you. Good morning, Judge Gerson. Good morning, Mr. Representative Norris. I am uh, new to the committee. I'm actually new to this whole procedure here. Actually, this is my. <laughs> well, I'm not going to say well, well, welcome, welcome. Well, uh, <clears throat> I've heard a lot of questions, a lot of concern here, whatever else, and I certainly don't want to minimize uh, abuse in any way, shape, or form, or be it domestic or whatever else. My my concern over the years has obviously been public safety. Uh, I have not had the opportunity to read. House Bill 610, uh, which I plan on doing. Uh, and from your testimony today, it, it appears that uh, our, our presiding judges already have the inherent ability to make these decisions. And this particular uh, attempt to codify this, this bill would, would, would restrict them and their capacities? Well, I, I, I think they're concerned, Representative Norris, in the way the bill is framed now, that it may limit them to only issuing an order of relinquishment if in the complaint and affidavit there is a reference to guns. And because there, it's not every situation where that evidence is, is, is there, number one, but a, but a judge may feel that relinquishment or non-possession is appropriate relief anyway. And so the language that is before you now for a lot of judges would limit the discretion they already have, and that's their concern. Okay, and I'd like to follow up. <clears throat> I'm certainly not asking your legal opinion here, but- No, no, I'll tell you if I can't answer it. Let's put it that way. Okay, so it's my understanding, first of all, storage is a major concern throughout the state of Vermont, I can assure you that. Uh, both the storage of the guns and, and, and uh, the firearms and along with the liability that goes along with it. but. You, you had mentioned search warrants and so on and so forth. Uh, now, generally speaking, if, if there's the temporary restraining order comes after the fact, uh, nine out of 10 times, police officers have responded to a residence and, and basically somebody has been incarcerated through my experience. The relief from abuse order comes after uh, the, the alleged victim has been given the opportunities for the assistance that's available to them. So that's when a worker will come in, fill out the appropriate form, affidavit, so on and so forth, and contact uh, the court, or more preferably the judge. So a crime, an alleged crime has been committed, but if the relief order is, is issued, and, and this is a, a very strong piece of paper, I might add, is if the relief order is issued, it gives a lot of protections for the, the victim. And if one of those conditions is that they, that they, the accuser who is probably now incarcerated for a short period of time is to vacate the property for a period of 10 to 14 days until they have their final hearing, what would you think would be, in your opinion, the purpose of, of, of uh, removing uh, any firearms within our residence? So <clears throat> let, let me suggest to you that you would be surprised, I think, by the number of relief from abuse order requests that are made uh, to the court that do not involve um, underlying criminal offenses. In other words, the individual who's seeking the relief from abuse order for uh, their own reasons have 
may have left the house, left the residence, but have not sought uh, police involvement in whatever issues that result in them coming to the court. So many, many of, uh, of, of uh, the cases that come before us, there is not underlying uh, criminal charges and the person, the, the defendant, if you will, um, is, is not under custody or, or under any, any restraints. Um, I would agree with you that in those situations where a crime has been committed, that does change uh, the, the parameters of, of what uh, law enforcement can do or not do. Um, what I was saying earlier was that, th remember, this is a civil proceeding. The, the relief from abuse is not a crime. The behavior that is described in an affidavit may appear to you or to me as a basis for a criminal charge, but that's up to the individual to have reported that to the police. Um, and so not, um, I, again, I, I don't think I have that data, um, but where, where a crime has been involved, it does change the ability of law enforcement um, to act. They may in fact have a search warrant for other reasons as a result of, of, of the of criminal activity, but they're, they're really two different two different proceedings. This is completely civil. Okay, I'll end with, with one, one final question and I'm sure- be I, I hope that answered your question, Representative North. It did. And there are times, yes, when uh, the, the accused has fled the scene and so on and so forth. I'm, I'm fully aware of that. Uh, so I, I thank you for uh, bringing that to everyone else's attention here. But in the case where uh, somebody has been lodged in mm -hmm. and uh, during the course of the, they, they've obtained this, this uh, part-time order, temporary restraining order. Right. And a judge orders the firearms to be removed. Uh, you had made the statement that basically they don't generally typically issue search warrants because there has to be a crime involved. Well, there is an alleged crime involved because we've removed this individual or someone has removed this individual from the streets and incarcerated them. So, for the protection of the law enforcement officers and or departments, individual departments, if the court was to issue something like this, don't you think it'd be prudent upon them uh, to issue a search warrant? Uh, just your opinion, not your legal, not your legal advice. No, no, that's all right. I'll be glad to go into this territory. We, we, we cannot order a search warrant unless uh, law enforcement, and it's usually the, the state's attorney and law enforcement contact us separately for a search warrant. So there may be an, a case where at the same time a person is requesting a relief from abuse order from us that the next phone call we get may in fact be from law enforcement in that particular case looking for a search warrant. So I'm, I'm not saying that the, it's not possible, but in my experience, it's, it, it's rare for that to happen, but it, it, certainly it's possible. But we, we cannot order a search of a home uh, based on a request for relief from abuse. That's why the difficulty in any order of uh, relinquishment, confiscation, whatever you want to call it, to a great extent uh, depends on self-report uh, by the individual when the police go to serve an order saying uh, plaintiff X says that you have two long guns and a, and, a, and a handgun. And the individual says, I do not have any such firearms or I they're not in the house, um, then the police are not authorized to go in the house to search for them at that point. They would have to then perhaps, depending on what evidence they have, then they may uh, feel that they have a basis for a search warrant, but it's a whole separate proceeding, a whole different standard of, of, of proof or evidence in order to get that warrant. So it wouldn't be anything automatic about that. And I agree, it is. Uh, thank you, Yarr. You're, you're welcome. Tom. Thank you. Uh, Judge Sutton, you said just jog something in my, my head for some reason, but so these are civil proceedings and not criminal. Yeah. And, and through a, a, uh, a civil proceeding, there's potentially personal property that's confiscated. And so I, I guess this, this is pretty narrow as far as uh, firearms go, but uh, would the same thing happen if somebody was potentially threatened uh, using some other type of weapon? 
You mean would we order a confiscation of weapons? Yeah. I suppose we could, sure. So so if somebody threatened to stab somebody, you could go for knives. Well, you could you could order that they surrender uh, knives, weapons. Right. What 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 about if somebody threatened to run somebody over? Would it would a car be confident? Well, I mean, it, it could be used as a weapon. I agree that it could be used as a weapon. I doubt that they would turn over the possession of a car. Because I, I just look at it as weapon and and. Uh... Um, and, and I just, for whatever reason, we're zeroing in on, on firearms when there's a, a, a large number of things that could be considered as being uh, a weapon or deadly or dangerous. So, I would, I would expect some orders say exactly that, that they cannot possess uh, firearms or other dangerous or deadly, deadly weapons. I mean, that, that would not be uncommon, again, depending on the particular facts that come before the court, you may be right. I, I just I just think uh, if they attempted to run someone over in a car, that would clearly, without knowing any more, I will say that if that's the facts that come before me, I would think it would probably warrant a, a relief from abuse, but whether uh, it would be another stretch to, to, to say that we're going to confiscate the vehicle. Um, w- w- I don't know what we would do with it. I don't know where it would go, who would pay for the impounding. I mean, that there's all kinds of issues with that. Um, that's why the, the, the orders uh, are very specific as to where firearms can go. There is a process, and I don't think you'll see any judge ordering a repossession of a vehicle. Right. Well, probably, not. probably not. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I just wanted to mention, uh, Bob, you had said that you would take a look at 610. Um, 610 was from last session. It's not in play anymore. Um, any bill that doesn't get get passed, it doesn't automatically get reintroduced. So uh, I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, thank you for that, Mike. I, was, I just wanted to read up on the, the, the storage. Uh, they mentioned anything in 610 about the storage of, of firearms? We'll have somebody. We'll certainly have witnesses on storage. Thank you. So. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands for Judge Grierson. Your Honor, thank you. Thank you very much. I know we've, <laughs> we've kept you for quite a while. Um, no, that's all right. I just wanted the committee to know and the other uh, witnesses that um, will continue to work on, on this bill um, along some of the lines that uh, I've suggested, whether they're interested or not. And if you need me again uh, for testimony, let let me know. Um, I do have another meeting that I have to go to now, um, if that's all right with the chair. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Appreciate your, you. your time. Thank you. Okay. So committee, what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, take a quick break. Let's come back um, at 10 after 11 um, so we can get Chris Bradley on. Um, Chris, I don't know if you need the whole 20 minutes or, um, or we'll need more, but certainly want to make sure we get you on. As I mentioned earlier, we have a hard stop at 1130. Um, obviously, this is not the only day um, on this bill. We have a lot of testimony, certainly all the people who are listed here and a number um, of requests for other testimony have been made as well. So, um, so let's come back uh, 10 after and, um, and start with you, Chris. Just real quick, Maxine, if, he, if we run out of time with Chris, Again, he would be able to come back. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, that was okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I yeah. just wanted to. I just wanted to hear it out loud. Yeah, no. I guess. No, no, yeah. thank you. Yeah, like like I'm saying, Chris, you can have the 20 minutes if you need more. You can come back. If you, if you don't need it, then we'll then we'll move on. But just want to make sure we will get to you. All right. Great. Um, well, thank you. Yep. Yeah, see you at 10 after. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as I said, I'd like to um, turn to Chris Bradley. We do have a hard stop, whether it's with you, Chris, or, or if we've moved to another witness at 1130. Uh, but certainly next week, we will reschedule this again. So welcome, Chris. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Grad, uh, Vice Chair Burdett, uh, Ranking Member Christie, 
House Judiciary members and distinguished viewers. For the record, my name is Chris Bradley and I'm both the president and executive director of the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs. And if you're not familiar with the Federation, we represent approximately 60 member clubs across the great state of Vermont with over 11,000 members and growing. Uh, I thank you very much for the opportunity to address you on H133. Prior to launching into my testimony, I'd like to make the committee aware that starting this year, the Federation has made a commitment to try to establish working relationships with leadership, individuals, groups, and organizations that are typically involved in the discussion about proposed firearm legislation. To that end, we have reached out to individuals like Senator Baruth and organizations like the Vermont Network and others. These conversations are cordial and polite. We are completely open going into them that we may not be able to agree, but we believe that this is precisely the type of discussion and conversation we need before bills get submitted. And I commit to you that we will continue to seek pre-committee dialogue. As for my testimony, I begin by stating that the Federation fully recognizes the need in what is hoped to be very rare situations where there may be a requirement to separate a person from their firearms by due process of law in compliance with the Vermont and US constitutions. We further understand that this is what is implied by 15 VSA 1103C1 when it states, the court shall make such orders as it deems necessary to protect the plaintiff or the children or both if the court finds the defendant has abused the plaintiff. Based on that, we fully understand the intent of H-133 is simply to codify what is essentially existing practice. And because of that, the Federation's initial reaction was that we could and perhaps should support this bill. Unfortunately, and after further consideration, we cannot support this bill in its current form. Although I will offer a five word amendment, which would change it into something we could support. The crux of our problem with both 15 VSA 1103 and 1104, as well as 13 VSA 4054, which if you're not familiar with it, is the Extreme Risk Protection Order, Emergency Relief Ex Parte Handling of Erpos, is that the standard of evidence in each of these stand statutes is preponderance. As a quick review, and I know we've heard it from the judge, um, standards of evidence that gives our judges basis to make rulings. It is generally accepted that there are three basic standards. The lowest, as we've heard, is preponderance. And to use the analogy provided by Judge Grierson, you can think of preponderance as being a feather dropped on one side or the other of a balanced scale. To have a preponderance, the scale only needs to move slightly, which means a level of certainty of something above 50%. Clear and convincing is the next higher standard. And if we think in terms of percentages, the weight on one side of the scale or the other would be a degree of certainty of about 71 or so percent or higher. Beyond reasonable doubt is a still higher standard which kicks in at about 91% certainty and that's a criminal standard. As another point of concern under 15 VSA 1104, I believe that a defendant can be ordered out of their own house a residence that they likely pay for based on only the weight of a feather. However, when it comes to seizing or relinquishing property that is specific to a constitutional right, and even though this is somewhat of a standard in current Vermont law, we do not believe that the weight of a feather should constrain a constitutional right any more than the weight of a feather should constitute constrain your right to free speech, religion, or assembly. Just so we're all aware of the impact to Vermonters that are involved with RFAs. And in looking at data from the Vermont Judiciary Annual Statistical Report for fiscal year 18, we see that there was 3,307 RFAs filed. Of those, 617 were immediately denied with the judge apparently not feeling the feathers weight. As a side note then, please remember that about one in five filings immediately fail for some reason, with such reasons including frivolous and punitive actions that are not unknown in domestic relations. That leaves 2,674 RFAs where the weight of a feather was felt. And because of preponderance language and the fact that firearms are not uncommon in a significant percentage of Vermont households, 
every one of those 2,674 cases could have resulted in an order to require the relinquishment of firearms. Of those 2,674 granted RFA cases, we then see that 1,469, or well over one half at approximately 55%, were subsequently denied or withdrawn for whatever reasons. That leaves 1,469 Vermonters which may have had their property removed due to nothing more than the weight of a feather. To me, it does not matter that this infringement on rights was only for a short period of time. To me, this appears that the effect is that almost 1,500 Vermonters lost their right to self-defense. Sadly, while we know the number of RFAs that do get filed and how that number breaks down across time, it appears that we do not know some rather basic numbers, such as how many times are firearms an issue in RFA proceedings today? How many times does a court require the relinquishment of firearms in temporary RFAs today? When temporary RFA orders are issued that require relinquishment, how many are subsequently withdrawn or denied? If we don't have these numbers, and I don't think we do, I think we might all agree that having accurate numbers such as these would make your decisions more informed and possibly easier to make. Perhaps that is something that this committee has jurisdiction over and can, can look into, and we are aware that there's a Senate bill looking into this as well. As another concern that factors into our lack of support is the inconsistency between our new ERPO laws found in Title 13 in comparison to existing domestic relation laws found in Title 15. A rather glaring difference between the two is, in, is that in 13 VSA 4058B2, there is language that provides a criminal penalty for someone making false claim or statements in an ERPO case, with this being a criminal charge of not more than one year or fined not more than $1,000. We see no similar language in Title 15, yet we know that these false claims are likely to be occurring as something must be accounting for the number of temporary RFAs being immediately denied, as well as the number of temporary RFAs that had a temporary order issued but were later denied or withdrawn. Should we not have consistency for making false statements and claims when a constitutional right is impacted in existing Title 15 statutes? Back to the point, you may have noted that I previously referred to preponderance as being somewhat of a standard when handling hearings, hearings when the defendant is or is not in court. I phrased it that way because it is not universal and there have been differences of opinion between the House and the Senate when it comes to the standard of evidence required for legal confiscation of firearms. For example, you may recall that a couple of years ago, the legislature passed S-122, with S-122 being a bill directed at extreme risk protection orders or ERPOs. In passing the ERPO statutes, it was understood by all that these statutes were specific to removing firearms from individuals who may be a danger to themselves or others. S-122 created both 13 VSA 4053 and 4054, with 13 VSA 4053 handling an ERPO when the defendant is present, and 4054 handling an ex parte ERPO. Speaking very broadly, these two statutes do for what for ERPO what 15 VSA 1103 and 1104 do for domestic violence in regards to hearing where the defendant is or isn't present. After much debate, I believe because both 13 VSA 4053 and 4054 directly impacted the rights that are protected under the Second Amendment and Article 16, the Senate opted to set the standard of evidence as clear and convincing for both 4053 and 4054. I further believe that they did so knowing what the standards of evidence were in 15 VSA 1103 and 1104. 
S-122 then passed the Senate with both 13 VSA 4053 and 4054 being clear and convincing. It went over to the House. The House changed the standard in 4054 to preponderance, but left 4053 as clear and convincing, and they became law as things came down to the wire. It is not just the Federation or our associated groups that believe that the removal of firearms requires a higher standard of evidence than just preponderance. The Senate initially decided on clear and convincing in regards to ERPOs, and I believe that this was because a constitutional right was in the balance. As one more side note, and just for your reference, when it comes to separating a person from their firearms in federal law, the United States Code that addresses this issue does not allow for ex parte proceedings. The defendant must be present. As mentioned previously, with the inclusion of just five simple words, the Federation would support this bill, and we suggest the following change. I'm quoting from the bill, and I'll make reference to our change. As it reads now, an order issued under the section may, if the plaintiff's complaint or affidavit includes information that the defendant possesses, owns, or controls firearms, and the court finds it necessary to protect the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children, require the immediate relinquishment, and the rest of it. What we suggest, an order issued under this statute may, a section may, if the plaintiff's complaint or affidavit includes information that the defendant possesses, owns, or controls firearms, and the court finds by clear and convincing evidence. It necessary to protect the plaintiff and the plaintiff's children, require the relinquishment and on and on. As you consider that change, and in the spirit of being fair, consistent with the removal of constitutional rights are being considered, we additionally ask that a new section for Title 15 be added into this bill that is specific to a criminal penalty being added for making false statements and claims. I very much thank you for your time. That is my written statement. I have submitted this to uh, Mr. Bailey. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Great, thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, and I appreciate your um, suggested language, giving us suggested language to consider and also as well as, um, as you said, reaching out to us before, um, you know, before today. And I certainly do, do appreciate the communication. Uh, Martin. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chris. Nice to see you again. Um, fairly narrow question, actually. Uh, at the bottom of your uh, page three uh, of your testimony, the you're citing to uh, federal court separating person from their firearms in federal court. I just was wondering what federal law or, or not federal court, but federal law. I'm just wondering what federal law that is. I'm just curious. I believe that's 922. Um, that is the law um, governing firearms. In, in what situation is that? I'm just- I'm, I'm, uh, this, this touches upon domestic violence, I believe. I don't have the statute right in front of me, sir. Okay. If it's possible for you just to send that, I, I'm just curious. I appreciate that. Oh, Thanks. not a problem. I'd be happy to. Thank you. I, I make myself available to any committee member if they have any questions for anything having to do with our perspective. Is there any other questions I can address? Um, Selena. Um, yeah, I so uh, echo others' appreciation to have you back and for the work it sounds like you're doing reaching out to folks. And Thank you. Um, I am just curious about your proposed provision of clear and convincing evidence. Uh -huh. um, and I'm looking at the underlying statute, which I know isn't posted to our page, but you know, there are a number of other conditions to the order that can be granted, um, such as- uh, Removal from your house. Remo uh, yeah, well, right. Uh, uh, contacting the plaintiffs, contacting the plaintiff for plaintiff's children, you know, et cetera, for the fixed distance. Um, and I, so I am wondering why, like, is your proposal that all of those things should have a, um, no, no, require no, clear no. and convincing evidence or just the relinquishment of firearms? And if the latter, why, why just that? 
our argument or our discussion is, is on the legal possession of firearms as outlined in the Vermont and uh, US constitutions. Um, I think for the removal of any constitutional right, there has to be a fairly high bar. I, I, it certainly can't be the weight of a feather. And I'm not going to tie into anything else going on. I, we, I had, I've already made a suggestion concerning a penalty that, that doesn't seem quite consistent across statute. And perhaps we should look at that. Um, but the, the core matter at hand is the uh, giving up of a constitutional right. And I've already prefaced this all by saying that there are situations where we don't argue, hopefully very rare, where this may be required. Anything else having to do is, is under your purview with what is happening, existing today with domestic violence situations. Um, however, all, I, all we are suggesting is that when we are looking at removal of firearms, everything else is under your purview for preponderance. But when it comes to removal of firearms, we think it clear that there be a little bit higher standard than just a feather. And that's what we're really, as Judge Pearson mentioned, it's a feather. I, I, if, you, if you think in terms of an ex parte hearing, you're, you're, you're going into a debate with one team not there. How can you not come up with a preponderance? Now, clearly, we see 617 being immediately thrown away, one in five, for some reason. And then we see almost half of the ones that remain being removed. These are, we feel very strongly that the bar on a constitutional right should not be a feather. It should be higher than that. And just as a, as a thought, when firearms are being confiscated, especially in a household situation, where does joint property enter in? I don't want to belabor my time. Is there any other question? I, I, this is a constitutional right, folks. It, it is, it's a very high bar. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chris. I do not see any committee members, any other hands. And, uh, and actually it's good timing. Um, Bill, I do see your hand up. However, this is time for committee members um, and I look forward to hearing your testimony when we uh, continue this. Uh, okay, so great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You're uh, most welcome. Yeah, and uh, we're not sure what day we'll be continuing, but we'll get back to it soon. Hopefully Wednesday or Thursday because um, that's when we have the most time in the morning and we can we can get um, we can get more folks in. Um, okay, great. Um, so committee, uh, we will be on the floor um, at 115 and uh, Tom, is it uh, best for send you emails, texts if we have any thoughts or uh, oh. Uh, what do you mean when when we're on the floor? If I get yeah. questions or yeah, um, yeah, let's do text. Text okay. would work best for me. Okay. Uh, I, I don't foresee um, too much with the the notes that I that I have informing into my um, presentation. I, I think most everything will be covered. But okay. Oh, great. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. So um, we will adjourn for the morning and go off YouTube. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.